Hey church, I hope you're doing well. So let me ask you a question. What's your approach to homework? How do you breach that subject? How do you like to do or don't like to do homework? I know you may have to go back a bit in time to remember the last time you had homework, but think back and, and how, do you, how did you approach it? For me, my approach has varied over the years. When I was young, my mom says that I like to get it done right away. She, in fact, tells of some young lad that would come home and do his homework straight away and wouldn't even want a snack or dinner or to play outside or to watch a show on TV or anything else until the homework was accomplished. I don't completely remember that, but I don't think my mom would be fibbing to me about that, and so I must have wanted to do the homework straight away. I do remember, as I got into high school, that things changed slightly. I still wanted to get the homework done quickly, but I also did not want to bring it home. And so my approach in high school was to get it done as best as I could in the school day. And how that would happen was a lot of times teachers would wrap up their lecture or whatever a few minutes early, and I would start working on that homework. I wanted to get it done while I was in school because who wants to take it home and bump into your TV or outside or whatever else time that you had going on. That was my high school approach. Do it quickly, but not at home, at high school, more or less. Then I moved into college and I, I don't know if my personality changed or just my uh, lack of responsibility changed. I, I don't know what exactly happened, but I became a bit of a procrastinator. Instead of wanting to do the homework early and get it out of the way so that I could do all of the fun things I wanted to do, I kind of flipped those things around. I did all of the fun things that I wanted to do and tried to do the homework after that. Last possible minute. That led to a number of late nights, uh, drinking a lot of coffee and or Mountain Dew and, you know, eating some candy along with it to try to stay awake, some overnighters and all of these things, attempting to cram everything in and on the paper before it was due the next day, usually in the morning. That was my approach to homework in college. Cram it on in there as late as possible so that I could have all the fun beforehand. Anyway, as an adult, I've also had to do homework. Here I am, middle-aged, and I had a class that just wrapped up last spring. Fortunately, I'm through with those for now, but, but I've still had to do homework, and so I have a late life approach to homework, which is a little different than my earlier ones. For now, what I like to do is kind of block out some time. Usually earlier, I like to give myself a window. I don't like to procrastinate. I don't like to do the homework last minute and find myself up late studying and all that stuff. No, I, I like to have it done. I like to have it done fairly early, but I, I block out some time. I, I make it a point to say, this is homework time. This is when I'm going to work on the class stuff. And I try to get it done beforehand so I'm not stressed out. And I also schedule my fun around it. Not as anxious as when I was little, I can still eat and do things, uh, not as procrastinating as when I was in college, and also not trying to squeak it in when I really should be or could be doing other things during the work or school day. Anyway, it's my homework approach now. And I imagine at this point you're asking yourself, well, why are you asking me about homework? Well, last week, if you happen to tune into the video, you know that I gave you some. I assigned some homework to you, and I hope that you had a chance to do it. Some of you might be going, ooh, homework. I didn't know anything about that. You're off the hook, no big deal. I can tell you the assignment. If you wish to do it, you're welcome to do it. Others of you might be going, ooh, homework. I forgot all about that. I hated that feeling. The, that feeling when the teacher was like, okay, everybody pass in your homework. And you hear rustling of papers and I'm sitting there going, eh, what homework? It's a terrible feeling. I like to turn mine in and try to get good grades. I didn't like the missing the homework, but maybe you don't mind. And so you, I say homework and you say, yeah, you told me I didn't do it. What's the problem? I don't know how you feel about that, but this is what I will share. Last week, I gave some homework 
You see, we've been in this series, Seven Days, Seven Churches, looking at the seven churches in the book of Revelation, and I assigned us an exercise following that series where I asked for you to write a letter as if Jesus was, was writing a letter through you to the church that you attend. And, and I asked for you to prayerfully consider what Jesus might say following the pattern of the letters to the churches in Revelation. So starting with uh, characteristics of Christ, moving into compliments of the church, criticisms of the church, a command in light of what the church has been discussed or in light of what Jesus has said, follow, finishing it up with a commitment, something that God has promised to do. And so that was the assignment, to prayerfully try to seek the Lord in what God might say to you in your church context and the place that you worship and how the Spirit might still continue to speak to his church, to his body, how Jesus might address us now. So this week, as we finish wrapping up what we talked about last week, last week we kind of did an overview, a review of all the characteristics of Christ, hopefully inspiring us to, to worship Jesus and to be sensitive to his Spirit. This week, I'm sharing a bit of my own homework, the, the letter that I wrote to the church that I serve in this context, and talking about some ways that the Spirit was prompting me, at least I hope it was ways that the Spirit was prompting me, and having a little bit of a discussion and opportunity for you to do the same as we continue to try to follow after Christ. So, as we go along here, I invite you to, to pause uh, the video if you wish and think about these different traits. Think about what Jesus might say in your context or in our context if you serve along with me or, or whatever the case may be. Think about them, um, write them down, jot down different ideas and have conversation with someone, be that a significant other, another person in your church, with me and see what God might be saying to us at this time, moving on as we, after we have wrapped up that series on those seven churches. So this is how the, the letter that I wrote goes. To the angel of the church in Middletown, that's the church that I'm serving, right? These are the words of Emmanuel, the one who grants wisdom to those who ask. These are what, the words of Emmanuel, the one who grants wisdom to those who ask. You see, I've been praying about the direction of the church and what Jesus might be saying to the church that I serve for quite some time. We've been going through this period of disaffiliation. We, we've been uh, doing some things where uh, things are up in the air and, and I've been seeking the Lord uh, about what's next. What's the plan? What comes next? How might we change? How might we grow? How might we um, be filled with your spirit more so that we might increase in our discipleship? What is next? And as I've thought about this stuff and prayed about this stuff, I'll be honest, my emotions have been all over the place. There have been times when I've been happy and encouraged about the direction of the church. There have been times when I've been sad and discouraged about the direction of the church. There have been times I've been stressed out, times I've been at peace, and I've been all over the place. And in part, it's due to a, a personal failure because I, I look at my own self as a, a leader of the congregation as to where we might go. And I know that I'm not capable of doing that. I'm not. If I rely on my own strength, on my own talent, on my own abilities, on my own wordsmanship or whatever it is, I will not lead the church to where it needs to go. I am incapable of doing that. I, I am. And sometimes I look to myself to find the answers. And that's not the place that I need to be looking. I need to be looking to God. And so as I was considering what Jesus might say to the church, it, it, one of the characteristics of Christ came from Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, where the word says, The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. I need and 
continue to need to be reminded that God is with us, that Jesus is with me, that I'm not tasked to lead the church into whatever comes next by myself, that that's not my job. I'm asked to participate in what Jesus is already doing here in this place. I'm asked to be a receptive vessel by which the Spirit moves and works. I don't have to have everything figured out in the long-term plan. What I need is to fix my eyes upon Jesus and follow after him and trust that he will lead and guide, that Jesus is with us, that Jesus is with me. I needed to be reminded of that characteristic characteristic of Christ, that he is Emmanuel, God with us. I was also reminded of a verse in James that I reference an awful lot, and I will reference it an awful lot into the future, I imagine, and that's James chapter 1, verse 5, that says, if any of you lacks wisdom, they should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to them. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask God. God gives it. Without saying, ah, oh, you're such a, a lame person that you can't figure this thing out. God gives us wisdom when we ask. And so that's a good reminder that that's a characteristic of Christ. That he grants wisdom, especially when we ask for him to do so. And so as I wrote this letter, as I did this homework, I was prompted to re remember that God is with me and that God will give wisdom especially when I ask and so those are characteristics of Christ that I needed to hear that I believe that that the church that I serve need needs to hear that God is with us and he will grant us wisdom with how to face the future how to go forward in faith how to proceed from this point forward that God is with us and that Jesus will grant us wisdom and then I move from the characteristics into a compliment, some way that the church is doing well. And this is what I wrote. I know your deeds. You have been a loving community of faith and you have been true to my word, no matter the cost. Middletown as a church, Middletown Fellowship Church, which it's now called, has been in this community for over a hundred years. And they've been serving the community. Sometimes the church has been full with seemingly every member for, of the community participating here in worship and discipleship and growing in their faith. Other times the church has had dwindling numbers. Still, the church remains and they remain in a spirit of love. The, the folks gathered love and care for one another. They love and care for their community and that is something they have done well and something they should continue to do. They've also been committed to walking in truth, no matter what that might cost. Disaffiliation was a difficult process, and for Middletown to leave the United Methodist Church, it cost financially, it cost in terms of effort and energy, it cost in a number of ways, possibly even in, in some relationships that were damaged because of the decision that was made. Yet the church knew how they wanted to respond in faith. They wanted to be true to the understanding of the word, to follow in a path that, that holds a, a traditional or orthodox understanding of scripture and marriage and sexuality and all of these things. And, and Middletown made that decision even though it cost them, even though it came at a price. They continued to follow in faith. And that is something they did well, following their convictions as it lined up with the scripture. They have continued in love and they have continued to be true to the word, at least as far as they are able. These are things that the church has done well and would be prompted to continue to do. Now, in your own context, I encourage you to find places where your church has done things well where they have been diligent in their faith or loving or giving or caring, where they have built people up or, or provided opportunities for mission or whatever it might be. Find an area or areas where the church has done well and focus on that for a while. The positive traits 
of the community in which you worship. Now we know these letters in Revelation follow those five C's, so characteristics of Christ, a compliment or compliments of the church, and then it moves to a criticism. And as we move to the criticism, we're to remember Revelation 3, verse 19, which comes in the middle of a pretty strong criticism to the church in Laodicea. Revelation 3, 19 says, Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. This is Jesus speaking to the church. He says, Those whom I love, I rebuke and I discipline. I show them where they are falling off, where they have come short, where they're not being faithful. He does this not to smash them down, but to build them up. And so as we turn to criticisms, and as I, as a pastor, move in that direction, I hope that you know this is in a spirit of love, that this is a difficult thing to do. It's hard to take a look at our weaknesses and hear those places where we may be falling off a bit. And I hope that, that you hear what I say in the context of love knowing that there are many things that we can celebrate, many things that are going well, many things in, in, in which victory has been given and we've been faithful, but also recognizing there's room to improve. There, there's room to get better. There's things that have not gone so well and, and places that we need to address in order to be the body of Christ and to, to grow in our maturity and in our faith and in our discipleship with Jesus. And so in that spirit, as I was praying these are the things that that I saw and I'm certainly open to you know moving this needle a little bit but this is what I saw even so I hold this against you that's how the the letters go you have been apathetic in some areas failing to consistently be intentional in discipleship worship and evangelism in some ways through all the different different season the church has just kind of gone along they just continued to do what they've done in the past continued to just kind of roll along in the same way without really being intentional in all of their choices or the reasons why they were to do or not to do different things they just kind of happened and to better share about that I, I thought maybe a story from my own personal discipleship or an example from my own personal discipleship might be helpful for me I can get into patterns of my devotional time so I wake up in the morning I maybe uh, do whatever I need to do brush my teeth drink get a drink of water all those things and then I sit down I read the Bible I pray a little bit I read a devotional material I journal and I'm done and it gets to be kind of a routine, just something that I do, a, a box to check off. And sometimes it loses its vitality. Sometimes it loses its life. Sometimes I, I don't even know if I'm really conversing with God or spending time to hear what God might say to me instead of just going through the motions of devotion, instead of actually having devotions to God. And I find that to be true in my own personal life, and I also see it to be true of churches. Sometimes we get wrapped up in just going through the motions of church. And maybe what started with good intention, with a solid theological reason, with, with a meaning behind things, just kind of become part of the motions. And we just kind of keep the ball rolling. And the ball sort of rolling in the community around this changes and the ball sort of rolling and the ways things are done kind of changes and the ball keeps rolling and we just kind of are going through the motions in some areas of faith and that can happen when what we really need to do do is you know kind of reestablish the the why behind our attentions to reestablish the that we are to be abiding in Jesus, at least, you know, personally and also corporate, corporately, that we're to live and breathe and move in Christ. So that the reason that we do different things is rooted in that. And we, we take time to ask the question, well, why do we worship in this way? Why do we serve in this way? Why do we try to reach the community in this way? Why do we do these things? And I fear that over time 
some of that intentionality has been lost in the church that I serve. We've just kind of gone through the motions. So for instance, uh, over COVID, we started putting offering in the plate at the door. And we've kept that practice up. It's not really a theological reason at this point. It's not even really a, a, a communal reason at this point. It was just the, we did that and now we've continued to do it. Instead of being intentional about what we do in the course of worship and why we do it, that our offering is a response to God, that we give back because God has given us so much and that being an act of worship. And this isn't just a criticism of traditional style worship, but we can get into the motion of we sing three contemporary songs and then we hear a sermon and we leave. And we just go through those actions without the meaning and the intention. And so I, I want for us to be aware that that has happened in our case, that we've kind of just rolled along, going through the, the motions of having church without always being clear about why we do things or don't do things, and also being open to doing things slightly differently as the Spirit moves and leads. And so that's a, a criticism that I have felt, a, a thing that I have thought at this point. And that, that verse that I referenced was John 15, 5, that, that Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches, remain in me, and I in you, and you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That as we worship, as we we seek the Lord, we need to remain in God in our, spirit, our personal devotions and also in our corporate acts of worship. Then from, you know, the the criticism, we we move to commands. And in I'll just say this in in terms of, you know, the criticisms towards Middletown, it's affected things like our discipleship, how we grow to be more like Jesus. It's affected things like our worship, how we spend time in worship together to, to have that um, communion with Jesus, conversation with Jesus, and in terms of evangelism or how we reach out to others. Those were kind of the three areas that I felt, felt like we've just kept doing what we've always done and maybe need some more attention to how we might change in light of the future. And then this is what uh, the command to be. Therefore, this is what I ask. This is what I require of you. Repent of the ways that you've gone through the motions of faith. Seek me with your whole heart. Continue to walk in love and in truth. The church needs to recognize where we've just kind of continued on because we like to or it was easiest to or because that's just what we've always done. And turn from those things to an active faith where the decisions that are made in terms of how we worship, how we grow, and how we reach others are made based on our understanding of who Jesus is and who Jesus calls us to be. That, that we return from sort of being apathetic about those things to, be, to care about them deeply because we want to be the people of Christ and we want others to know the love of the gospel as well. So turning from those, repenting from those ways we've been apathetic, following after Jesus, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness with our, our whole heart and continuing to walk in that love and that truth that we have had. That's the way that see those characteristics of God coming together, knowing that God is, is with us and then holding on to a commitment that I feel God offers us at this time. And the commitment comes from Hebrews, verse 13, or chapter 13, verse 5. To the one who overcomes, be reminded of these words. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. We know that Jesus is our Emmanuel, our God with us, the one to grant us wisdom. We know that, that we've done well in some areas and that we've fallen short in some areas. We're to turn from those things where we've fallen short and we should continue to do those things where we've done well. And through all of that, we need to know that God is with us. We, or some, may choose to leave God, but God will not choose to leave us or forsake us. It's a commitment that he has made, both to me and to you, to be 
with us, to continue to offer us wisdom, to forgive us for what we've fallen short, and to go forward with us into the future. Whoever has an ear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Friends, what, what God may be putting on your heart in terms of characteristics, compliments, criticism, command, and commitments might be different than what I shared, what was on my heart at this point. But we can trust that we serve a good and loving God, one that will not leave us or forsake us, and will guide us into the future, that we might follow him unafraid. May you go now and follow after Jesus, trusting that he is God with you now and for all time. Amen.